Praise be to God. Good to see you all here. Hopefully you're doing well. God's grace to you and his peace be with you tonight through Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior, once and future King, our present King, the coming King, the one who has come and is coming again on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Thank you, God, for being with us tonight. We're in Romans chapter 14. And uh, we've been looking at the treating your brother who is weaker than you or maybe a stronger brother's weaker brother's based on whether you think you can eat food or you can't eat food, you, whether you should observe certain days or not observe certain days. Paul is basically saying all of these people should just get along kindly and peacefully. A strong brother who knows he's at liberty and can eat all foods should not for the sake of his principles destroy people who think that they can eat only vegetables. And this is especially probably poignant in the early church because you have Jews and Gentiles in the early church and the people that principally, this is not limited to this, but that would be having dietary restrictions and observing and esteeming one day is better than another would be the Jews in the church because that's what they were raised with. The new covenant, Jesus Christ teaches us all foods are clean and all days are holy. So everything is the same in that sense, but that's a mature position. And not everybody's at that point. So those who are mature should deal patiently and kindly with those who are weak and don't yet understand these things. And uh, like vice versa, those who think that they can eat only certain things on certain days and only observe, uh, be observing certain days shouldn't pass judgment on the ones who know their Christian liberty. So basically, get along and be nice to each other. In Christian love, uh, we're all growing in Jesus Christ and it, you know, we'll be mature and perfect one day, but we're not all there yet. So be uh, patient with, you, with each other. And he says, especially do this, verses 10 and following, uh, because you're going to stand before God to give an account of yourself one day. Every human being will. So you can't miss this court date. Everybody will be there. So you don't want to go there having destroyed people over trivial principles, smaller principles, of the faith uh, and destroyed all the work that Christ did to save them for the sake of things like hamburgers or whether you can put cheese on a burger and boil a kid in its mother's milk like the Old Testament would say, you know, and uh, put the two together. You know, Jews don't do that, right? They don't eat cheeseburgers because you can't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Hence, you have milk and meat. You don't put those two together. You can't put cheese on a burger. You can eat cheese. You can eat a burger, but you can't eat a cheeseburger if you're an Orthodox Jew. So that kind of stuff, Paul says, that's, that is, uh, you know, that's, that's the old time stuff. And that's also old, old Testament. It's an old inferior covenant. And in the new one, you're free. All things are clean for you, as he's going to say shortly. But don't judge your brother because guess what? You have a judge. You're not his judge your brother's judge, but you have a judge, God, you're going to have to stand there. So be kind and wise and, and uh, helpful towards your brother. Build him up. Don't destroy him over these issues. That's what he's saying. There is a right position, by the way, namely liberty, but at the same time, be patient with each other. And, and we're all growing in these things. So, so each of us shall give an account of him, shall give account of himself to God, verse 12. We're on verse 13. That's where we're picking it up this week. Then let us no more pass judgment on one another, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. If your brother is being injured by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died, so do not let what is good to you be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God does not mean food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So let's go through this a little more. Don't pass judgment on your brother we talked about, but decide, resolve, set it in your heart that this is the way you're going to act. Not to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of your brother ever. So, um, you could easily do that in this case, 
by making a huge issue of your Christian liberty with someone who thinks that you can only eat vegetables and you make such a huge, huge point of it, he's going to stumble over that and could be destroyed. Even his own faith could be wiped out and he could be ruined over such an issue like this. Don't do that. Um, and so he's going to say later, um, you know, even though he's free to eat all things, he would gladly only eat vegetables as long as he doesn't hurt his brother in this matter, and his conscience. So, uh, <clears throat> or to build one another up. I know and am persuaded of the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. So, what does that tell you? There is a right position on this matter. All foods are clean. You're not, you have kosher and non-kosher. No, Christ declares all foods clean. This is a new covenant, not like the old one. So everything's clean. You can eat anything you want, provided you do so with thanksgiving, because that consecrates it, and everything God created, you're free to eat. So he says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus about these things, that all foods are clean. That's pretty tough for Paul to say, since he grew up as a uh, super, super, super Pharisee. Namely, he was of the strictest religion of the Jews, studied under Gamaliel, he was persecuting the church more violently than anyone else and zealously because he was zealous for the law. And for him now to have made the shift and now say, I know Christian liberty and I'm going to live in, in it, that is huge. But he, was, he knew it and he was persuaded about it in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul, he was better than Peter, wasn't he? Remember Peter in Antioch? He was... Uh, schmoozing with the Gentiles, but then some people came from Jerusalem, from James, zealous for the law, and Peter draws back and no longer eats with the Gentiles, and Paul, the previous uh, uh, conqueror for the law, stands up and rebukes Peter to his face and puts him in his place and basically says, you're departing the faith. Toe-to-toe. Toe -to -toe. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Paul was extremely convinced about this, because, well, he had the confirmation of the apostle upon him. God's revelation. These things are indeed clean. And that's what the rest of the scripture says too in the New Testament. Yes? We understand that if cleanliness of food was important 2,000 years ago, but what would be a modern example of this in our Christian world? Yeah, yeah, we, mm -hmm. yeah, we were talking a little bit about that. You haven't, you know, you guys were on in Kentucky and stuff, but um, we're talking about like, uh, Alcohol, for example, and uh, beer. You know, are you at liberty to drink a good German Lutheran beverage of beer? Yes, you're at perfect liberty to do so. Or a glass of wine. You're not free to get drunk, because that is a sin. But you are free to have a glass of wine or whatever. But you might have other brothers and sisters in the Christian faith who consider that a sin. And so in that case, they are weaker brothers in that sense, because they don't understand Christian liberty. You are free to do so, provided you don't go into excess with that. But if you get mingling with a group and they all believe it's a sin, you shouldn't then go into their presence with a beer or a glass of wine and do it in their face or also perhaps entice them to that because they're thinking it's a sin. So that one might be an, one, one modern example of it. You know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's others. If you're in pretty, an amiable situation, Yeah, yeah there's, there's, she's not preventing, encouraging, and helping your weaker brothers to come into Christian liberty. And it may be that in your Christian liberty, you choose not to drink one drop of alcohol. That's perfectly fine. You're free to do so, provided you're not uh, doing so on a kind of conscience as if, as if it's a sin to do, so, uh, to do otherwise. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I may, and I have for a large part of my, of my life, not right now, I probably have a glass of wine tonight, but... Uh, for most of my life, I've just—I don't like alcohol anyway, <laughs> basically. And I've said, eh, it's not really helpful to me." No, I'm, I'd have gone years without it, and then I'll maybe have a glass of wine occasionally, and then go again another six months without a glass of wine or whatever. But I, I'm not doing so on account of my conscience. I'm just like I don't like it. <laughs> so and I'm free to do it if I want to, and I'm free to do it not to do it if I want to, and I'm free not to do it. I don't want to do it. Although tonight. I've gotten in the, 
you know, having a glass of wine a couple times a night. A couple times. I mean, a couple times a week. I didn't mean a couple times a night. A couple of times all through the day. No. A couple of times a week, I have a glass of wine, maybe two, three. And then I'll go months without it, you know. So yeah, I kind of find it kind of relaxing and kind of nice. Something to look forward to after the long, drool day. But uh, at any rate, we are, have Christian liberty. We have Christian freedom in these matters. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. Share with them sure. Share That's perfectly okay. We should encourage and, and eventually, eventually, all eventually attain a like-mindedness, right? So eventually, we want to all be in Christian liberty and freedom. But there are some who are more mature than others because we all came to faith at different times, or we all have different personalities, or we've all been under different tutelage and teaching of pastors, and you know, uh, we just want to be gentle and loving towards one another and hopefully teach each other in a gentle way, correcting your opponents with gentleness, as Paul says. Of course, that's big opponents in that case. But um, yeah, so we, had, we should eventually arrive at Christian liberty, all of us, and the knowledge that it's not a harm of conscience for whatever you do. And most, most, most modern Christians that I know in America are that way with respect to alcohol. There's a few you meet that think it's a sin. Or smoking even, is smoking a sin? No, it's not, it's not mentioned as a sin. It's not a good choice. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Same thing with food choices. All things are lawful. You can eat anything you want. You could live on Cheetos, Ho-Hos, and Ring Dings if you wanted to, but you might not live so long. It might not be a great choice, but you're free to do so in terms of conscience. You're not, God's not going to smite and destroy you like we feel guilty. Oh my goodness, I ate chocolate cake last night. I feel so guilty. Well, that's you. That's not God. God's not putting that on you. That's, that's, that's uh, Seventeen Magazine and Cosmopolitan putting that on you. So, uh, that makes sense. So, yeah, we should always be growing in these things, and we're all growing in these things. We're all works in progress, aren't we? Yeah, we should all remember that we're works in progress. Nobody's a finished product yet until the Lord comes and glorifies us. Yes. Uh, you should not go against this. Absolutely, because even if he's free to do it, if he does it thinking it's a sin, it's a sin. That's right, yeah. So, so that's whatever, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin, he's going to say here shortly, which is kind of interesting. I said this as an example the other week. If we had a little picnic down here behind the church, and all the hamburgers are free, and someone comes along late to the party and thinks that they cost $5, and wants to steal one, the hamburger's free, but he stole it thinking it cost something that was a sin for him. So it was a crime. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you think, well, if it's complicated, think of this. If you think drinking a drop of alcohol is a sin and you do it, you sin. Even though you have liberty to do so, because you thought it was wrong, you sin against your conscience, therefore it's a sin. So we sin in thought, word, and deed. So that thought matters. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we're all works in progress. Even maybe you've done everything right in life, and yet you still feel guilty. You ever feel like that? <laughs> not that we ever do everything perfect, but I mean, you've really not committed any major sins. You just, just feel bad about yourself <laughs> or something like that. We can be like that, some of us, <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we need to distinguish on that one, too. Um, to, to walk in the freedom of the gospel. So, not judge ourselves unjustly or our brothers unjustly. If a brother is being injured, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean, that's verse 14. If your brother is being injured by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. So, the ultimate goal of a Christian, along with, I mean, we walk in truth, we walk in love. Those two have to go together. We speak the truth in love, Ephesians chapter 4. And we build each other up like all in one body, Christ being the head. And we nourish and grow, speaking the truth in love to, one and to each other until finally we attain maturity and are a full, perfect body under the head of Christ. 
So, um, walking in love. What is it to walk in love? If you look at um, 1 John, uh, that letter, look at what he calls it there and how you can parallel this. It says, This is the message that we've heard from him, namely Jesus, and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and don't live according to the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. So do you want to walk in the light? Yeah. Or do you want to walk in darkness? No. You want to walk in the light. What is it to walk in the light according to the apostle John? Look at the next chapter in verse uh, 8 and following. I'm writing you a new commandment, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already, already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness still. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and in it there's no cause for stumbling. But he who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where, he, where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So what is it to walk in love? It's to walk in light. If you don't walk in love and you harm your brother, that's walking in darkness. So you want to be we're children of light. Let's walk in light. A good part, big part of walking in the light is walking in love, in the truth, in Jesus Christ. So we build each other up. Isn't that what you want to do? You guys do great at this. But we want to always encourage each other in these things. Okay, do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let what is good to you be spoken of as evil. So you can actually do that in this case, or in drinking, or in smoking, or something else like that. You can say, you've just sinned because you have not given up your cigars, or your pipe, and therefore you're going to hell. You could destroy someone's faith. They're not damned for this. It's a bad health choice. But it's not a sin. It's not going to damn you to hell that you sm smoked a pipe. My goodness, then most of the Christians through ever since the discovery of America would be damned, right? Up until most recently, and then we got rid of smoking. It's amazing our, 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 our modern culture is so crazy that we consider smoking a sin and we make planes smokeless, which I'm happy for because I can't stand it, but even so, and then you still kill babies. And yet smoking, that's a terrible sin. But killing a baby, that's okay. Abortion. Number one cause of death is abortion? Yep. Wow. So, at any rate, don't destroy people over trivial issues. Uh, you can help them, try to talk with them, go in a better way, understand things better. But we're all works in progress, and don't destroy people over these kinds of issues. Don't, for the sake of food, cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So don't let what is good to you be spoken of as evil. What's that mean? What's good to you, namely you can eat all things, I can eat all things, but I'm condemning you for eating a cheeseburger. Or whatever it is. Well, if I do that and I destroy that person for eating that thing, then they're going to look at my position, which is the right position, that all foods are clean, and it is the good position, people are going to speak of it as evil. Because I'm using that position, which is right and good and true, destroying people with it. Then what's good now has become evil, in that sense. Same thing with smoking or drinking or something like that. Uh, for the kingdom of God does not mean food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what we're about. So uh, we, we can tend to get focused on little tiny trivial things when in fact we're free. Now, not all things are helpful though. What are some other issues? Drinking, smoking, uh, let's see, going to movies. Can you dance, right? Yeah. Celebrating a certain day? Yeah. These are all kinds of issues that are not specifically described for us in Scripture. Not all things are helpful, but you're at liberty where God has not spoken on these things. We don't want to add to God's word or take it from it. Not all things are good for you, though. I mean, a lot of movies are just garbage but you might learn something from them, even so, even if they're evil, they might, might spur you on by the Holy Spirit to think of something good as the opposite of there or something. 
you know, I take a lot of movies and things and I transfer them into a Christian perspective or something, like Horatio Hornblower, you know, just an average kind of movie, but I think of it, I take parallels and I c compare it to things I see in the Bible or something. And at any rate, so, for the kingdom of God doesn't mean food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So that's, let's focus on the second part of that sentence. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you have these in your life? Righteousness, yeah, our righteousness, but really Christ's righteousness that covers us, which produces, by the way, also joy and peace, right? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Do you have peace? Do you have joy in the Holy Spirit? Where do these come from? In the kingdom of God. The gospel. The distinguishing of days and the distinguishing of kosher versus non-kosher and that kind of stuff, that's the law. That's not going to give you peace. It's not going to give you joy. It's not going to give you the Holy Spirit or righteousness. It's just a pseudo-righteousness, which will fail. Uh, but if you want true righteousness, that's Christ's work in you. That's his covering you in the gospel and then working something good in you because he first loved you and you begin to love others. And we should have peace as Christians. You know? We also wrestle with that. We're not perfect with that. But keep hearing the gospel. That's why you've got to keep coming to church and keep hearing the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, like we said last Sunday. And we need to keep hearing those messages and then peace will arise. And joy in the Holy Spirit. We should have joy in our lives. And that's something the Holy Spirit produces. It's one of, the, one of His fruits, right? Along with peace and other things. So... Um, that's why you come to church. I should hopefully, when I'm preaching, you know, I do need to convict sin at times, of course, I do, but the ultimate result of you coming to church should be a more peaceful, more joyful experience in the wonders of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're here to do. And that's especially through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the law. All right, so... Hopefully, we have these things. If we don't, we all, we're all at various levels. Let's grow in that. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants your next day to be better than this day because we're going from one degree of glory to another, regardless of outward circumstances. He who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. In other words, both of these guys, whether you're limited on whether you have certain foods or skip, skip certain foods or are you free you're in liberty everybody's trying to serve christ in this case the person who's refraining from smoking the person who feels he's okay to do that and that's not a, the best example but but uh if you're a christian and you've believed and you're serving christ you're acceptable to god whether you are eating foods or you're not eating foods whether you're observing days or not observing days but we want to get you to the point of liberty that you know these things are free, and then in your liberty you can choose what you want to do, what you feel is helpful to you. you know? So, uh, approved, acceptable to God and approved by men. So when you're living this way, God accepts you, but also people like you. <laughs> Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That's kind of a conclusive comment here. A summation of what he's saying. Pursue, go after, seek, run towards, uh, find as in, just go after as for treasure, those things that make for peace and for mutually upbuilding each other. So that's what the Christian church does. I mean, my hand here, if I, you know, like uh, I, had a, I had a yogurt today, I don't usually have a different brand, and it like upset my stomach, so what do I do? my body immediately goes over and lays down and I hear and I like put my hand over it. I'm like, oh, I feel terrible. But what, did, what happened? My stomach didn't had a problem. My whole body ran to the help. Lay down quickly, Greg. Put your hand over it. You'll comfort yourself. And, uh, and then my mind goes to work comforting yourself. It's okay. You'll be okay in a few minutes. <laughs> whatever. But look, if one of us is hurt, what happens is all the rest of the church, the Christians, run over to help that person because we're all part of one body and build each other up and heal that part. When one of us is injured, ow, I hit my finger with a thumb. 
immediately you put your other hand over it and comfort it, right? You get stung by a jellyfish, you know, over here. Oh, you immediately cover it with your hand because you're helping each other. You're building each other up. That's the way it should be in the whole body of Christ, as it is in our bodies. That we look after each other, weep when one part weeps, rejoice when one part rejoices, and uh, build each other up. That's what it's about. And you're doing that, and you're doing it greatly. So, let's do it more and more. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make others fall by what he eats. So, the work of God is to save this soul. Yeah. God's been working and working and working and working, and even predestined and praying this before the foundation of the world, and sent Christ, and now has sent preachers and evangelists and brought someone to saving faith, and is growing, and the person's in the kingdom, and he's growing up in Christ, and God's pleased with him, and you come along and destroy him for the sake of a cheeseburger? That's not a good thing. Don't destroy, for the sake of food, the brother for whom Christ died. That would be kind of like, remember that Italian cruise ship that, that the guy had like a, like a bad meal? <laughs> I forget what happened. What was it? I wrote it down here some time ago. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's like making a $500 million cruise ship, or however they cost, Driving at a ground for the sake of a stunt done by a head waiter. That's happened recently in Italy. This was when I preached this previously. Remember that cruise ship that went aground? <laughs> but can you imagine having a super, super, super big cruise ship, whatever, how much, however much it costs, I don't know how much, and you drive it aground because of a, you know, a bad move by a waiter or something like that? That's destroying the work of Christ for the sake of a cheeseburger or a day or something. Just let it go, Paul says. Let's be kind to any, with each other, patient, and grow each other up in liberty. Okay. Mm. Uh, and then he goes, uh, everything is indeed clean. So that's the proper position. That's the proper understanding of things. Liberty. But it's wrong for anyone to make others fall by what he eats. It's right not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother stumble. So does, did Paul do this, by the way, in his life? 1 Corinthians 9, To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To the Gentiles I became as a Gentile, in order to win Gentiles. To the weak I became weak, in order to win the weak. To, to these I became this. He morphed into whatever he needed to do in that particular situation, so as not to put stumbling blocks in the way of the real message which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's willing to, you know, take, take uh, Timothy and circumcise him. So Paul, who's preached against circumcision, takes Timothy and circumcises him in order not to offend the Jews so that Timothy can go around and do the ministry of the gospel. Because whether you get circumcised or not, it doesn't matter. But if it's going to offend somebody, get circumcised in order to get into the company that you can then preach the gospel to them in that case. Right? And Titus was not circumcised. Fellow worker for Paul. Different situation. But I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might by all means save some, says Paul. Okay. So if you, in this case, uh, are with people that don't eat meat, and you do eat meat, what should you do? Uh, they don't believe it's right to eat meat, and you do believe it's right? Don't eat meat. Skip it. Skip it for that meal. Skip it while you're with these people. Don't offend them over this. Let it go. He says, um, it's right not to eat meat or drink wine, or, uh, drink wine or do anything that makes your brother stumble. So give it up while you're around those people if that's the case. You don't want to harm their conscience or entice them to sin or cause a big trouble over that. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Now, don't take that one out of context because we want to share our faith with everybody. But if you believe it's right to have all days be holy, and another person thinks one day is better than another, you can get into a discussion and gently help them to come to Christian liberty about it. But 
but uh, basically don't make a huge point of it in that sense. If it's going to cause him to stumble, keep it to yourself. Just, yeah, stay out of their business. You know? Stay out of their business and, and don't destroy their faith is the main thing. Guard their faith. Keep their faith. You can encourage and teach, their, teach them about these things, but don't push the point to the point you destroy, the, destroy their faith. Happy is he who has no reason to judge himself for what he approves. If, you're, if you know what's right and you're doing that, that's good. But he who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he doesn't act from faith for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. That's a huge sentence, isn't it? All right, so he who has, is con he who has doubts is condemned if he eats. But isn't it, aren't you free to eat? Yes, you are. But if you don't think you're free to eat and you eat, you're condemned. Because you went against your conscience. We shouldn't sin against our conscience. Isn't that in James as well? Hebrews, James. Um, whoever knows what is, yeah. James 4, verse 17. Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So there again, it's a conscience thing. If I know it's right to go help this person and I don't help that person, then I've sinned against my conscience. In this case, if you think something's wrong, when actually it's okay to do, but you think it's wrong and you do it anyway, you've sinned because you've gone against your conscience. So conscience is very important. It's a whole other subject, too, is uh, our consciences, can you trust them? Not all the time. Sometimes. But our consciences are like a compass on a ship. And compasses by themselves work, but when they are around a big metal ship, if you're on a steel ship, the compasses can go all over the place because they're also reading other things other than the pole. They're the magnetic pole, they're reading the ship. And so the compass can be all over the place. That's why on big ships you have other two steel balls that have counteracted the ship so that the compass will read true. Well, so what we want to do is have those balls namely, that are next to the compass, the scriptures, to recalibrate your compass so that your compass reads correctly. And as Christians, our consciences are rightly calibrated and they're finely tuned, but they're not always accurate. So we need to recalibrate them continually by the Word of God. You might have had a great day and done a good thing, but you still feel guilty because the devil is trying to accuse you. He's trying to make you feel guilty when you didn't really do anything worthy of feeling guilty about. Right? Not to say we're not without sin and all that stuff, but, but you might have had a great, let's say, let's say a great sermon or something like that. And you feel, oh, I didn't do as good as I could have or something. You're feeling guilty over it. That's, that's a wrongly calibrated con uh, conscience. You know, or, or uh, um, you know, Yeah, we want to, we want, yeah, the Word of God is complete. So when we judge ourselves, I had a sermon on this that was on the radio that you put on, which I really liked. And I, and I remember listening to it while I was getting the signs for Vacation Bible School at Lickety Split Signs in Meridon. And I was like, that was a good sermon. Did I preach that? <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, that just so ministered to me <laughs> about how we think of ourselves and how we view ourselves and that our self-talk should be it's rightly calibrated when it's in accordance with the Word of God. But we can condemn ourselves a lot of times when the Word of God is not condemning us, or we could let ourselves off the hook when the Word of God is condemning us. We want to have a right understanding of ourselves is when our understanding of ourselves is in agreement with what God thinks of you and is saying of you. So if you say to yourself, yeah, that one too. Yeah. If you just say to yourself, loser, you're no good for anything. What's the matter with you? You're a failure. You're never going to be good for anything. Is that the way God talks to you? Then is that the way you should talk to yourself? No. no. That's a wrongly calibrated inner speech and could be born of a wrongly guilty conscience and other things like that. You want to calibrate by the word of God. Speak to yourself internally as God who speaks to you. View yourself as God views you. If he says you're free, you're redeemed, you're loved, you're accepted, uh, I take joy in you, then those should be the things you think of yourself. Easier said than done, though, right? But we're growing in it. Okay, so we finished that chapter. We could go just a few verses more here into Romans 15.
All right, so this picks up on the same topic. Uh, basically, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to edify him. Same point, right? If you're strong, bear with their weaknesses, their failings, and uh, yeah, don't go after pleasing yourself. Please your neighbor for his good to edify him, to build him up. So as Christians, we put others before ourselves. God is first, then comes our neighbor, then comes ourself. You can take care of yourself and love yourself, but put your neighbor first, above you. His, his things. For Christ did not please himself. It brings in the example of our Lord. But as it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached thee fell on me. Of course, he's quoting there Psalm 69. For the zeal for thy house has consumed me. That was quoted in John 2 as when Jesus cleaned the temple. And the insults of those who insult thee have fallen on me. That's Psalm 69. That's a messianic psalm. Which also says, they gave me poison for food and my, for my thirst. They gave me vinegar to drink, which was fulfilled on the cross. So that psalm is a psalm about the Messiah. The Mashiach, the Christ, Jesus. And so Jesus, the insults of those who insulted thee fell upon me. So he took that. He didn't please himself. He, re he received the reproach for others. The reproaches of those who reproached thee fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. What's that tell you about the Holy Scriptures? It says... Whatever is written in former days was written for our instruction. So the Hebrew scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament in this case, because the New Testament's being written, but we could include to it the, Old, the New Testament since we have it now. It's written for our instructions in God's love to build us up. What's the whole purpose of all holy scriptures? To bear testimony to Jesus Christ. And as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, Continue in what you have learned, he tells Timothy, and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says, all scripture is inspired by God, etc. But what's the purpose of scripture? To instruct you, to teach you about salvation. And salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of scripture. That we believe on the Lord and be built up in that. So, uh, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. So the whole Old Testament, you can consider every page, every letter, every word, every jot and tittle of these things. God is meaning to teach us things by it, and for our good. So it's a great place to go, isn't it? That word gives us life. That by steadfastness and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Do you hope for things that you have presently? No, you don't hope for, uh, you know, uh, I don't hope for a car, I have a car. I might hope for a car I don't have, but that's in the future. I don't really hope for cars, I don't care about cars, but you don't hope for things that you have. You don't hope for a sweater and a blue blouse. You have a sweater and a blue blouse. You might hope for something else in the future. So we're hoping, we, have, we're, we might have hope we are uh, looking for a bright future, in other words, by the scriptures, by steadfastness. That means, in the Greek, hupabone, which means bearing up uh, under all kinds of circumstances, enduring and being patient, bearing with evils, enduring perseverance or constancy under suffering in faith and duty. Hupa mane, hupa means under, mane to remain. So you remain under, bearing up steadfastly under trials. That's what we do as Christians. It's not a, you know, sometimes we somehow watch too much, so much TV, we think life should be easy and fun. <laughs> this book instructs us differently and says, you have good times, God blesses you, but you expect tough times in this world. The good times are coming in the world above and to come. Yeah, steadfastness and the encouragement of the scriptures. I love that word, encouragement. The word in the Greek is paraklesis. Does that sound familiar? 
paraclete. Same, same word is, is, describes Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. They're paracletes. So guess what? The Holy Scripture is a paraclete too. It's an encourager to you. Remember Barnabas' word? They, what was his name previously? Justice or something like that? Barnabas in the Bible, in the New Testament, Acts. Uh, he was named, surnamed by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So that's what we need. Encouragement. Encouragement means a fainting heart finds fresh vigor and, and uh, bravery to go forward and conquer and win. That's what we need all the time. And that's what we get by the scriptures, that we might have hope. We'll just finish just the next five and six, then we'll conclude. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, I love this verse, I love this verse, I love this verse, that God is a God of steadfastness, meaning He's constant with you. He perseveres, He's patient with you, He's long-suffering with you. I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O oh, Jacob, are not consumed. So, He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He's constant. His, his mercies are new to you every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Steadfast love is there every morning. So may the God of steadfastness, I love that about Him, in encouragement. I love that He's an encouraging God. Who's the discouraging God? The devil, with a little g, God. If you are hearing in your mind words from the Lord, that you think might be from the Lord, but you just hear them in your mind, and they're discouraging you in your Christian faith, those are not from the Lord. It'd be either from the enemy or from, from yourself. So we've got to discard such things. Discouraging thoughts. That's what the devil does all the time. He's firing flaming arrows at us. The shield of faith is going to quench those things, and deflect them. Easier said than done. It's a battle. But notice this. God is an encouraging God. He could just destroy you if he wanted to because he's so holy, but that's not who he is. He's good. He, he, he remembers that you're flesh and he's spirit. He remembers how frail and weak you are. He is here to always be next to you and encourage you. It's almost like having a life coach, as they say. You know those life coaches? They became popular some years ago. Can you imagine having someone that was like awesome, an encourager who stood right next to you and walked with you into the store and laid down, put you to sleep at night and got you up in the morning and were, was there when you had breakfast and, and is there when you're down and is there when you're working and is there when you have a happy day and a bad day and you're facing trials and he's right there and he's always encouraging you and marvelously so. Wouldn't, wouldn't you pay for that? Would you? I would. But here we have that in God and in the Holy Spirit. He's always here encouraging you, helping you on your way in Jesus Christ. You're, you're just children. He knows you're not yet fully mature. He's bringing you up till you are mature like Christ. But He's always encouraging. What a great thing to know that God is like this. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. So may it be His blessing upon you that all the brothers and sisters, whether you be weak or whether you be strong and in different positions, that you love one another. You can sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron and instruct in one another, but do it in love. Speak the truth in love, gently helping and encouraging one another. In accord with Christ Jesus, that together with one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose and the point, the, the, the heart of God, really is that we be one with one another. That's what the whole kingdom of God is about. If to walk in love is to walk in light, and to walk in light is to walk in love, what's before us? What is God's kingdom? It's a kingdom of light. It's a kingdom of love where everybody mutually encourages each other, deals with each other gently, uh, lifts each other up, is patient and long-suffering with, with, with each other, bearing with each other's failings and weaknesses, and so glorifying God by caring uh, so compassionately with one another to encourage. And, you know, we don't like what's going on in the world right now, do we? I mean, new world order, global elites, uh, inflation, uh, possible food shortages, uh, rumblings and troubles here and there. But you know what? We have each other to go off through all these things with it, to encourage each other, to help each other, to bear each other up, 
So we're in great shape. We were part of a great team, a company, a family of saints. God's at our head, and he's going to encourage and keep us through all these things for a world very soon to come, which is our hope, which has no more problems and is marvelous in glory and health and all the joys in that right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16. God's, God can't wait to pour it out on you, by the way. But he's, he's got his timing for things. So let's bear each other up and, and encourage each other in the meantime, as he does us.